Welcome back to Daily Reddit Stories. Let's start with the story. My ex sold our home without telling Maine and gave the money to his new girlfriend. Now I'm fighting back with my Mills help in court. I was stunned when I received the news that my ex-partner had sold our home without telling me. To make matters worse, he had split the proceeds with his new girlfriend. I felt utterly betrayed and hurt, not only by his actions but also by the fact that he had moved on so quickly. I couldn't believe he could be so heartless. I was left with nothing and it was as if the last few years of my life had been erased. Feeling lost and confused, I turned to my ex-mother-in-law for some comfort and support. She gave me a stern look and said, you need to take legal action. As the mother-in-law talked, her eyes narrowed and her voice grew cold. She was clearly not pleased with her son's behavior. Let me tell you, dear, she said, when my son did the same thing to me, I took legal action. I got a lawyer and fought him tooth and nail for what was rightfully mine. And you know what? He lost. He lost everything. I could see the hurt and anger in her eyes and I knew that her son's actions had deeply wounded her. Despite her anger, though, there was a fierce determination in her voice. You don't have to put up with this. You can fight back. You can take him to court and make him pay for what he's done. And if he tries to fight you, you just remember that I'm here for you. I'll help you in any way I can. As I listened to her words, I felt a sense of hope begin to rise within me. Maybe I didn't have to just accept what had happened. Maybe I could fight back just like my mother-in-law had. Her words stayed with me for days as I began to research my options and gather the courage to take legal action. And when I finally did, I knew that I had the support and strength of my mother-in-law behind me. Soon it was time. The day of the court hearing was nerve-wracking. I arrived early, my heart pounding with anxiety as I waited for my lawyer to arrive. When he finally did, he gave me a reassuring smile and a pat on the back. You've got this, he said. We have a strong case. The courtroom was packed with people and I felt a sense of shame wash over me as I realized that everyone was there to witness my personal drama. But then I caught the eye of my mother-in-law, who was sitting in the front row, and her expression of fierce determination gave me the strength I needed. The proceedings began and my ex-partner's lawyer made his case. He tried to argue that my ex-partner had a right to sell the house and split the proceeds with his new girlfriend. But my lawyer was quick to counter, presenting evidence that showed that my ex-partner had acted illegally and fraudulently in the sale of the house. As the lawyers went back and forth, I found myself growing more and more tense. Every time my ex-partner's lawyer spoke, I could feel my anger rising and I longed to stand up and scream at him to stop lying. But then it was my lawyer's turn to speak, and he presented a document that completely destroyed the other side's case. I cannot tell you what it contained due to privacy. The judge nodded his head in agreement and I felt a surge of relief wash over me. In the end, the judge ruled in my favor. My ex-partner was ordered to pay me back the full amount that he had taken from the sale of our home plus damages. It was a victory that I had never expected and I felt tears of gratitude and relief streamed down my face. As we left the courtroom, my mother-in-law hugged me tightly and whispered, I told you that you could do it. I'm so proud of you. And in that moment, I knew that I had not only won a legal victory, but I had also gained a fierce ally and friend in my mother-in-law. I felt a mix of emotions, relief, exhaustion, and a sense of victory. I saw my ex-partner standing outside the courtroom. He looked defeated and angry, but I didn't feel any sympathy for him. He had brought this upon himself by betraying my trust and selling our home without my consent. As I approached him to collect my check, he muttered some half-hearted apology, but I didn't want to hear it. I took the check from him and walked away, feeling proud of myself for standing up for what was rightfully mine. The weeks and months that followed were not easy. My ex-partner tried to appeal the decision, but the judge upheld the ruling. I had to deal with lawyers, paperwork, and other legal battles, but I never lost sight of my goal. I was determined to get what I deserved and not let my ex-partner's betrayal destroy me. Update 1. A few months had passed since the court hearing and life had been looking up for me. With the settlement money, I was able to buy a new house, and my business has been thriving. I had even started dating again and had met someone who treated me with love and respect. But then, out of the blue, I received a message from my ex-partner. He was broke, he said, and needed my help. He begged me to take him back, promising that he had changed and that he would make things right. But I knew better than to fall for his empty promises. I had been down that road before, and I had learned my lesson. The only thing he cared about was himself. The memory of his betrayal of him selling our home and splitting the proceeds with his new girlfriend was still seared into my mind, and I could never forget the pain and heartbreak that came with it. I politely declined, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. He started sending me threatening messages, warning me that if I didn't take him back, he would ruin my life. At first, I tried to ignore him, but the messages kept coming and the threats grew more and more violent. I was terrified and I didn't know what to do. That's when my mother-in-law stepped in once again. She had always been a source of strength and support for me, and this time was no different. 
she asked me to get a restraining order against him. The decision to get it was one of the hardest choices I ever had to make. The weight of the emotional toll it would take on me was daunting, but I knew I had to protect myself from my ex-partner's harmful and threatening actions. If the process of obtaining a restraining order was a harrowing experience, it required me to dredge up past traumas and provide in-depth evidence of his threatening behavior. I had to collect and present a range of documents, including police reports and witness statements, to prove my case. I was eventually granted one. I received a copy of the restraining order and detailed instructions on how to proceed. The order required my ex-partner to stay away from me, my home and my workplace, and prohibited him from contacting me in any way. It was a difficult time, but with my mother-in-law's help, I was able to get through it. As I look back on everything that had happened, I realized just how much she had done for me. She had not only given me the strength to fight back against my ex-partner, but had also been a constant source of love and support throughout it all. Around a week later, my mother-in-law received a call while I was with her. She put it on speaker. As I listened to the argument, my heart sank. My ex-husband's voice was loud and angry and his words were harsh and accusing. He was yelling at his mother for helping me get the restraining order against him, blaming her for his current situation. I could hear my mother-in-law's voice on the other end of the line, calm and steady, as she tried to reason with her son. She explained that she had only helped me because she was worried about my safety and that she had done what she thought was right. But my ex wasn't listening. He continued to shout and yell, his anger escalating with each passing moment. I felt a sense of dread in the pit of my stomach, knowing that this confrontation was only going to make things worse. Despite my anxiety, I couldn't help but feel grateful for my mother-in-law's support. She had been there for me throughout the entire ordeal, helping me navigate the legal process and offering me emotional support when I needed it most. Finally, my mother-in-law had enough. Her voice became firm and authoritative as she put my ex-husband in his place. She reminded him that his behavior was the reason for the restraining order in the first place and that he needed to take responsibility for his actions. I could hear my ex's tone change, his anger turning into defeat. And he hung up. As the call ended, I let out a deep breath, feeling a sense of relief wash over me. Despite the conflict between my ex-husband and his mother, I knew that I had someone in my corner who would always be there for me. NTA. I can't believe how selfish and manipulative her ex-husband was to sell the house and split the money with his new girlfriend. And to add insult to injury, he had the audacity to ask Op to take him back after all the pain he caused her. It's disgusting and unacceptable. I'm glad she had the strength to say no and get a restraining order. No one should have to put up with that kind of behavior from a partner. The mother-in-law deserves so much appreciation for supporting Op during such a difficult time. It takes a lot of courage to stand up against your own child and do what's right for someone else. Her willingness to help shows the depth of her love and care for Op. I think Op doesn't have parents or she would have gone to them first. It's rare to find such an understanding and compassionate person, and she is lucky to have her in her life. Clap hands for Op's strength and resilience in the face of such a challenging situation. It must have been incredibly hard for her to relive the trauma of her past relationship in order to get the restraining order. But she did it, and she took action to protect herself and move on with her life. It's inspiring to see someone take control of their own life and refuse to be a victim of someone else's actions. Finally, someone who doesn't take everybody's bullshit. Next story. I have four daughters, Charlie, 25, and Amy, 21, and my stepdaughters, Claudia, 15, and Rose, 17. I had a son, Isaac, who was Charlie's twin. He passed away from leukemia when he was 19. When he was diagnosed at 14, there were a lot of medical bills to pay for Isaac's treatment, and I ended up working a lot to pay for his hospital bills. During that time, my ex-wife, Brenda, slept with Jake behind my back. I found out about the affair and we had a divorce when the twins were 15 and Amy 11. All of them knew the full story of what happened and my ex and I had 5050 custody. And Charlie visited Brenda till she was 16, after which she stopped. We told Amy what happened when she was 14. But the thing is, Jake is quite wealthy and Amy preferred it there more because she got spoiled. She eventually chose to stay with Brenda when she turned 16. During this period, I met Lucy. I fell in love with her and got married when the twins were 19. Isaac passed away a few months later. Lucy herself had two daughters, Claudia and Rose, and they were both welcomed into the family. My son passed away a few months later. When Amy moved with her mom permanently, she cut off all ties with us. She didn't leave peacefully either. She insulted everyone in the family and left. One of the things she yelled was, I don't want to be a part of this shitty family. She went no contact with us too. In November, Jake and Brenda were charged with fraud. B and E, and apparently they were also in debt. They lost their homes and were thrown in jail. Since none of the other relatives were able to take her in, Amy came to us. I didn't want to take her in, but Lucy convinced me to let her stay for a bit till she got back on her feet. Well, ever since she left, there have been a lot of changes to the house and Amy has been complaining about them since she arrived. 
She complains about how she can't touch the snacks and how she has to pay for her own snacks and clothes. We feed her three meals a day and afternoon snacks. How she was given the smallest guest bedroom and how the other girls got big personalized bedrooms. How on Christmas the girls got amazing gifts and she only got a gift card. The last straw for her was New Year's. We took the to a big party while she stayed at home. When we got back, she started yelling at me how I'm a horrible father and how I replaced her with Claudia and Rose. I told her that she's the one who renounced the family and so she wasn't allowed in family things. But a lot of people are telling me that I'm essentially replacing her for something she did when she was a young impulsive teen. So, Reddit. Ada. Edit. I would like to add everyone including her has been in therapy before she left and after she came back. Nothing has come out of it. Amy has also made it clear that she wants no relationship with me and is here because she's desperate, and she made it clear and told it to my face. Update. First of all, I want to thank some Ita's commenters for their point of view and advice. It didn't ever cross my mind that Brenda could have manipulated Amy. After reading some of them, I did sit and try to talk it out with her. However, it didn't end well and we did end up yelling at each other. Second of all, I would like to clarify some things. Yes, my wife had to convince me to let Amy in. She, Amy, showed up at my house in the middle of the night demanding for a place to stay without any explanation. I only found out about Brenda being arrested after the police came to talk to me about it. No, I didn't tell my then 11-year-old child that her mother cheated on me, and she was told when she was 14 to 15. It Someone pointed out that I put Amy in the worst guest room in the house. I would like to clarify that there are two guest bedrooms in the house, and the only difference is that the bigger one has a connecting bathroom. That one is being used by Lucy's nephew, whose college is nearer to us and he pays us rent. He was visiting his family during the holidays, so it slipped my mind he was there. For the people who are still hung up on the fact that I make my eldest daughter and Amy pay for snacks, which only they can eat, I would remind you they live here rent-free. No chores except keeping their rooms clean and they are being fed four times a day and their college is fully paid for. As someone who grew up in Europe, this is much more than anything I got and their friends are getting. Yes, this whole thing is in my point of view. I have tried to be unbiased as I could see I was angry when I posted here. I would also like to add I have no idea what happened at Brenda's house while Amy was there. I would also like to say that Amy no longer lives here. We just found out that she was pregnant from a hookup and she wanted me to support her and the baby. A sort of exact conversation. We did it in our language so I had to translate. Me. So what are your plans with the baby? Amy, what do you mean? It's your grandchild. Me. Yes, but they're your child. So what are your plans? Amy. I have the education fund in my job. I can buy an apartment. Me. What about college? Amy. I can drop out. I mean, you're here, aren't you? Me. So, the kid is your responsibility. If you don't want them, I'll adopt the kid and take care of the kid but not you. You still have to find A to survive. Amy. So, you'll take care of the baby but not me? Then me and her started to argue. That was a summary of the conversation. She left a few days ago to her friend's house and when she got approved for a dorm is now in her hostel. Esh. Amy was 10 when she found out her brother was dying. You threw yourself into work and her mother threw herself into the arms of another man. The adults couldn't get it together so you two broke up the family instead of focusing on your children's trauma. Then, just as her brother is dying, you make sure she knows that you left because her mom cheated. I don't blame her for not wanting anything to do with you at that age. You should have all been in therapy. I'm guessing there's a lot more going on, but Amy has had time to process her teenage feelings. I'm not surprised she's failed to thrive as a young adult with such trauma and lousy parents, but it sounds like she has taken to the victim role and is causing trouble for your stepdaughters who are blameless here. Therefore, she sucks. You suck for not realizing what you did to your poor kids and not being grateful she's willing to have anything to do with you now. Apologize for how things went down when she was a teen and for punishing her since she's been back. Her response then is up to her. Info. What does Charlie think about the situation? Does she live with you too? I will try to give you an explanation on how I see all of this. I may be wrong, but I may be right too. I understand she hurt you, but you have to understand that your daughter went through a lot of trauma. She lost her brother, saw her parents' marriage break into pieces and both of them building a new life with a new family. She wasn't mature enough at 16, so she chose her mother due to mostly materialistic reasons. Now she's 21. She lost her family again and lost her home and she came back to the only other home she ever had, probably hoping to find some traces of her previous life with you. Instead, she found out you replaced her with a new family and erased her presence from the house. I'm not blaming you. You did nothing wrong. I'm just stating how I think she sees it. She wanted to find her old home, but things are not the same anymore, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed between you and her. She is your daughter, and this is probably your only chance to reconnect with her. Talk to her one-on-one. -on -one. Tell her how you felt and how you feel and ask her to do the same. Do therapy if needed. I know you did family therapy, but I mean only you and her, not the whole family. That will come later if things go well. Results will be slow.
It will take a few sessions, but if she understands that you didn't mean to replace her with a new family, that she hurt you and if she wants to actually reconnect with you at least a bit, things will go better. I will not say why to, because I don't think you are at fault but I'm not sure that she is at fault either. I think you're simply two people who hurt each other and went through a lot of traumas and grief. Talk to each other sincerely, please. Next story I 35F him 37M. What are the odds he will ever grow up? It's terrifyingly sad that the things I listed were some of the more tame things he has done. They're just the more recent things. I want to clarify that him and I have been together four years. My 12-year-old is from a previous marriage. This has been extremely eye-opening and cathartic. I will use this opportunity to get some of the other things he's done off my chest. It's not good. I should have left before it began. I know that now. When we were dating, we lived in different states. It was his turn to visit me. My childhood cat took a turn for the worse suddenly and had to be put down that day. He was mad at me that it happened when he was visiting. He was mad that there was traffic on the drive and I had to console him while I was crying about my cat. He never expressed any empathy about my cat. He always slept with his sheets tucked in. I hate that feeling and stuck my foot out of the side and untucked mine. He said, now that actually frustrates me. My then 10 years old was nervous to walk down the aisle at the wedding rehearsal. He was the ring bearer. I told him it was okay and that he could just do it on the actual day if he was comfortable. Husband did not talk to me the rest of the evening. Was so mad and yelling at me on the drive home. Wouldn't talk to me all night. Wouldn't talk to me all night. Wouldn't talk to me the next morning. Everyone was in town for our wedding and he wouldn't even talk to me. I finally made him talk to me and he was so pissed off that I didn't make my son walk down the aisle to practice. I have never wanted to celebrate our wedding anniversary. It was 100% ruined by him. It's not a pleasant memory in any way. Before our wedding, I asked him to listen to two songs to chose one for our dance. He was mad that I was deciding between two and that I didn't know which one already. Minus seven days after we got engaged, I found him laying in a pitch black bedroom all alone staring into nothing. He finally told me what was wrong. He said that I wasn't taking our engagement seriously because I hadn't booked a venue or anything yet. Yet thought he was the only one doing anything. He hadn't done a single thing. We went to the beach last summer. I planned to go with my in-laws and my two kids and it'd just be a quick trip without husband. He insisted that he wanted to go. He started complaining the second we walked out the door. This drive is too long. The road is stupid. I hate GPS. Why can a gas station? The road is stupid. Then we get there and it's windy. My son was having so much fun in the hotel pool. Husband laid on a poolside chair and complained that it was windy. He was hungry and no one planned anything but him. Everyone was disorganized except him. We wanted to get pizza and have an easy night. He refused to help pick what to eat but said he wouldn't eat pizza. He then went up the room and don't help plan at all but was mad that we weren't eating. Every time it was time to eat on that trip, he would ask me what I had planned and I would say nothing. That we could all decide together. He laughed at me and said of course. I woke up that next morning to him staring at me while I slept. Like he was mad that I was asleep and not up planning what he would eat. We went to find a souvenir shop. He was mad that I didn't know which one he wanted to go to too. He saw one on the way in and I guess I was supposed to memorize where it was. My son has anxiety and gets afraid of being alone. He was showering and called for me. He said he was scared and husband yelled too bad. I went in there anyway. But it was like this every time he showered. His grandma has a Mother's Day lunch at her house every year. He has ruined every single one for me. When my baby was two months old, my first Mother's Day with him, I was trying to get myself, my baby, and the food we were bringing ready. Husband laid on the couch complaining that we had to go. He didn't help with a single thing. Didn't help carry anything. Nothing. Just complained. My husband has a very bad anger problem. He's made at me at least once a week for something that has nothing to do with me. He complains about everything and then takes it out on me and the kids. Examples. He said he wanted to help me wash my car. He turned on the radio. We started and he complained about everything. This car is too big. I can't reach the top. Next time I'm getting a car with simpler wheels to clean. This hose is too short. It's too hot. This brush sucks. This spray sucks. I use too much soap. This radio is pissing me off. I turned it off for no reason. Just on and on the entire time. If work is bad in any way, then he texts me saying he is quitting and going to find a minimum wage job because money isn't everything and then I need to start preparing for that to happen. I will then tell him that we need to talk about different jobs for him so we can be prepared, and he says, don't you think I know that? I'm not a child. But then won't talk to me about it because he doesn't feel like it. But we have that conversation at least once a month. If I eat lunch or any meal without making him something, he gets mad. One time I thought he was asleep. He was laying down with his eyes closed and had been for a while. I quietly made myself some leftovers. He came in later and said, I guess you thought I wasn't hungry. He was so angry. We have a one-year-old and a 12-year-old. I had to take my 13-year-old to some family two hours away. 
The one-year-old stayed home with my husband. Before I left, he said that he hated I was leaving. He said that because he didn't want to take care of our baby alone. After I left, he texted me saying that we weren't doing this again. When I got back, he was mad and told me I need to tell thank you for taking care of our son. I didn't want to say thank you because he complained the entire time and because he is his son. He shouldn't need a thank you for taking care of his own child. I clean as much as I can throughout the week. But with the baby and the fact that I work from home, some things get left to the weekend. He voluntarily cleaned the bathrooms one Sunday. I was taking care of the baby while he cleaned. He came to me after he finished and was sulking and said, I feel like I deserve a thank you and a hug because I've done so many chores and I don't feel like you care. I laugh. I couldn't help it. He got really mad. A couple days ago, he came home for lunch and barely talked to me. I asked him how his morning had been, and he kind of scoffed and said fine. He replied to everything I said with one word. Then when he got home from work for the day, he was obviously still in a bad mood. So I just greeted him and left it at that. He was quiet for a while and then said, aren't you going to ask me about me day? In a very mean way. I said, are you going to ask me about mine? He got mad and said in the rudest, most sarcastic tone, how was your day, Amanda? I just looked at him and told him that he was way too sensitive about me saying the right thing at exactly the right time and that it wasn't fair to treat me like that when I have been nothing but caring and engaged our entire relationship. After that last one, he asked me to be intimate with him that night and said, I know I was a jerk earlier, so I understand if you don't want to. I immediately said no, but it made me feel bad. He never actually apologized or explained. What are the odds that he will ever be better, or is he just a man-child who will never change? Thanks for watching till the end. Wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share. I'd love to hear from you.